Art? Okay. All right, so this program intends to show early New Brighton area homes and homesteads. We'll show you the house as it was, prevent some history, and then as it looks now. However, we could not cover all the old homes in New Brighton, but in the New Brighton area, but we'll cover a lot. But the Foss House is, is the one that is the most known to us, and I'd like to introduce our Foss House owners right now, Kathy and Dave Brewer, who own the Foss House. And then I will read to you this. The, the Peter Foss House is located at 321 Silver Lake Road, just east of Silver Lake, and was designed and built around 1892 to 1894. The pic picturesque home is still standing, a little bit that way. is still standing and is historically and architecturally significant as the largest and most intact Victorian home in New Brighton according to the National Register and the Minnesota Historical Society. So today it's listed on that National Historic Register. Foss was a farmer and fisherman in Norway. He began farming when he came to the Monsey Township in the 1880s. He and his wife Ingerborg raised their six children on the farm. You all know where this house is, don't you? On Silver Lake Road. And when I was growing up, we always called it the witch's house. I don't know if you did. But the land on which the Foss House stands was previously farmed by the Bowers family, who settled at the Silver Lake site at least as early as 1874. Josephine Bowers, a widow, sold the land on which the house stands to Peter and Ingeborg Foss. The house was built in those years, 1892 to 1894. The family moved into the house in 1894, and in 1944, Peter Foss divided his properties amongst his family, giving the house and 10 acres to his daughter, Esther Swanson. Here's a picture of how it looked in 1980, which was the year that the Historical Society was formed. And there's a side view of it. And here's the Foss house today. And this comes directly from a Christmas card that Dave and Kathy sent me. Isn't it charming? I just love this picture. Then there's the Swan and Hannah Swanson House. The Swanson Dairy Farm was located at 578 Silver Lake Road. The farm was established around 1900 by Swan and Hannah. They sold raw milk directly to customers on routes in Northeast Minneapolis. The farmhouse was built in 1914. The previous house was then turned into a garage seen on the left. And after Swan died, Hannah and her children, Jelmer, Ernest, Anton, and Hilma, Hilma ran the farm. And Anton Swanson married Esther Foss in 1926. That's the connection to the Foss family. This house still stands. Do you, do you know where it is? It's right on Silver Lake Road and Fifth Street. And it sits back a little bit, and it has trees now in front of it. But there is how it looked in 1980, and there is how it looks today, and it's home to Burkhart Plumbing today. It's a remarkably beautiful house, still in great shape from when it was built. And in the late 1920s, Sears Roebuck and Company offered homes via catalog. This one looks somewhat like the Swanson House, if I go back to that, right? but I doubt that they use this service. But many homeowners took advantage of having their home provided by Sears. And here, craftsman style homes were very popular during the 1920s and 30s. You may have seen homes like that in our area. Now we're gonna move into the Arden Hills area, Charles and Aurelia Perry. They were the first residents of Mounds Township in 1849. The homestead was on the western shore of Lake Johanna where Charles grew potatoes. Charles and Aurelia raised 13 children there. This home was built in 1871 and the photo was taken sometime in the 1900s. Part of this house is still standing and until the past years had been occupied by a great granddaughter of Charles and Aurelia and she's here tonight. There they are, Clark and Ida Nan. Adair. The Perry home today sits kitty corner from Lake Johanna Beach. Charles Perry was the son of Marianne Borkin and Abraham Perry, who were early settlers of St. Paul, 
who were among the settlers of the Selkirk colony in Canada in the early 1820s. Aurelia was a daughter of Francois Latender and Jean-Baptiste Morisset of Quebec. Charles Perry operated their popular bathing and picnic beach at Lake Johanna, which son William took over at Charles' death. Charles Perry spent the last 55 years of his life at his place on Lake Johanna. When he died at age 88 in 1904, he was then the oldest settler in Ramsey County and had lived continuously in Minnesota for 78 years. So guess what? The house is still standing. I talked to the Perry cousins and they tell me it is now an Airbnb. So I went to the site and here is what the home looks like today as an Airbnb. Now the Perry family, or Clark and Ida Nan, sold it to a neighbor who rented it out for a while and we're not sure whether that person is running the Airbnb or somebody else ha has taken it. He does. He does. He does. And from what I understand, left it to the renter. So whether she still owns it or she sold it, that I have no idea. So you can go and stay in one of the oldest homes in the New Brighton area. This is the home where William II and Ojalia Divine lived. This house still stands on 664 10th Street in New Brighton. His father, William, William Divine I, and wife of Florence Lillian, owned the Divine Hill in downtown New Brighton. Do you remember seeing this house? It's by the railroad tracks. And that's the view of it in the 1960s, and that's how it looks today. Do you recognize it? I happened to live in the house right next door to that. My parents rented the house next door to the Divine House at the time. And there was a little trailer home in the middle and we used to babysit there as well. <laughs> Gospel Ridge of New Brighton. Many of the early homes in New Brighton on 3rd, 4th, and 5th Avenue earned the name Gospel Ridge. The name came from the heavy involvement of activities related to the New Brighton Congregational Church on 5th Avenue. Here's an early photo of a residential street, 4th Avenue and 7th Street, in the old Gospel Hill area of the early village. Notice the dirt streets. <laughs> Here's the Charles and Murdy May Espinet House. This house belonged to Charles and Murdy May at 678 4th Avenue. Charles Espinet was the agent at the Stockyards Depot, which he operated ever since coming to the young village in 1897 until his retirement in 1938 when the station was closed. The house was later known as the Jandell House where inventor William James operated his telephone and electricity equipment. The house still stands. The Espinet home in 1980, which was once owned by Winfried and Miriam Claussen, my parents, that's the house I grew up in. And that's how it looks today still stands. It's got to be 1890s. This was the second home of the Esminet family. It was built in 1925 and the home still stands at 447 6th Street across the street from the former First Congregational Church of New Brighton. And this is how the home looks today. It's just amazing to me how these homes look so much like they did when they were built and they were obviously built very well because they've lasted. Here is, is the Amel uh, Amy and Amelia Dupre house. This is located right next door to my house at 672 4th Avenue. Amy and Amelia were the parents of Gladys Divine Walbon and they rented the house. Later it was owned by Roy and Elsie Chuck, then by the Newham family. And we have a, a Chuck gal here today, raise your hand. Did you grow up in that house? Okay, okay. And the full home looks the same today, doesn't it? Here's the home located at 703 4th Avenue, the Roy and Helen Kaczynski house. It was also lived in by the Stanislavski family. Now, is that correct? Am I saying that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, there is the home today. Now, many of these home uh, pictures from today came from Google Street View. And the other ones I just drove and 
took the pictures myself with everybody watching who is this lady taking <laughs> pictures of our house. This home still stands. This is the John DeMars home, located at 681 Fifth Avenue. It was owned by John DeMars, who was the oldest of 24 children born to Ken Deal and Adeline Lemlin. He was the brother of Ida, Mrs. William Perry. The original St. John the Baptist Church was located just to the north, and this photo was loaned by DeMar's granddaughter. And look how much it looks like today. Preserved nicely. I grew up right behind the alley with, from this home, and my dear friend, Joanne Prickett, lived in that DeMar's house growing up as well. Yes? Say that again. Who donated the picture? Yeah, you know the name? Ethel Rayberger. I'm sorry, I can't hear those questions. I have a hearing issue. I'll talk with you later, okay? Here is another view of the DeMars home. Walter and Lydia Beiswinger Olson home was located just to the south. Both homes are still standing. Riding in the buggy are Adolph and Maple Bills, Byswinger, and Carl and Lillian Borden. And that's how the house to the, to the right looks today. This home is still standing at 305 6th Street. It was built in 1919 for the Shirley and Mana Reasoner family, which also included children Rollin, Margaret, and Marion. And Look how much it looks like it today. Now, you'll remember this house on 6th Street because it has the red barn in the backyard. Do you, do you know where I'm talking about? In wonderful shape yet. Here's the Searles' home. Wayne, where are you? Okay. The Searles' home was located at 657 4th Avenue and still stands on the east side of the street. In 1889, William Franklin Searles was the owner of a coal, lumber, and feed business and became the local postmaster. Pictured here are wife Sadie with Franklin and daughter Mana, son Dewey in the wagon. Other children included Coy and Maud Searles. The house is still standing. And it does look pretty much the same. They've, they've removed all of the filigree around the, the porch, but it looks very much the same. And next door to the Searles' home is the Carl and Lillian Olson Borden home at 663 4th Avenue. And there's the Borden home today. The Schmalzbauer home in 1905 was located on the site of the former municipal liquor store on 5th Avenue in downtown New Brighton, now the present day Brighton Green Townhomes. The home was later bought by Son Butch and moved to 790. Fifth Avenue, where it still stands today. Early resident Otto Schmalzbauer came to New Brighton near the turn of the century to establish himself as a foremost businessman, cattleman, butcher, realtor, village official, and to raise a large and prominent family. Do you know where this is? Kitty Corner from City Hall. Just Kitty Corner across the street. Here is pictured Hubert Langer's first home in 1911 in the Rice Creek, Irondale area. Truck gardener Hubert Langner developed tomatoes that had the reputation as nicest on the market. Hubert, married to Jenny Langner, also hired a number of employees to help with their garden, and their daughter, Leon, went to market herself after her father's death. That house no longer stands, but next there is the Nils and Leon Aronson home on 2120 Long Lake Road on Rice Creek. This house still stands today. It's about where the bridge is. You know where that would be on Long Lake Road? And it, it doesn't face the street, it faces the creek. And the creek was very, very important in New Brighton history because as a little child, Leon would go and dig up arrowheads in the creek, and that is, was the basis for our last year's annual meeting, that Arrowhead collection that she gave to the Historical Society. 
Here's the first and only home of Frank A. and Eleanor Bona Blansky. It was built in 1932 and sold in 1987. It still stands at 5051 Long Lake Road, originally the Irondale residential area. And you couldn't see it very well, but look, the door is the same. The front door is the same. Here's the Farrell home. The John and Mary Farrell home is located on County Road E2 and New Brighton Road, just west of the former Ramsey County Library in Arden Hills. The Farrell family purchased the land from Major McLean, the local Indian agent. They farmed more than 500 acres on what is now located St. John the Baptist Church Complex and Moundsview High School. The home still stands. Farrell, who came to Minnesota in 1857, married Mary Doran in Lindsborough County, Waterford, Ireland. The Farrells first lived on Pig's Eye Island in St. Paul before they moved to Moundsview Township. Old Bet, a well-known Indian woman, became friends with Mrs. Farrell. In 1949, son Tom Farrell donated 10 acres of land to St. John's Catholic Church for their new parish, school, church, convent complex being planned. And the Farrell property extended as far as Moundsview High School to Lake Johanna Beach. When first coming to the area, the Farrells lived in a house on the small island on Lake Johanna. Later, they bought 160 acres and added to it until there were 500 acres. Of the three boys and four girls, only two of the children married. And you can see this home nestled in its picturesque haven of land, hills, and fields southeast of New Brighton. Do you know where this is? County Road E2, right? Still stands. Here's the William and Rosalie Perrin home. The home of William and Rosalie Perrin is still standing near the corner of Cleveland Avenue and County Road E, First Avenue Southeast. This photo was taken about 1920. William and Rosalie raised five children, Elmer, Marie, Albert, Violet, and Nick Perrin. The home was later occupied by the Ed Lawmeyer family. And we have, there they are. We have a pair, uh, Lawmeyer here today, <laughs> and Perrin as well. Now, here are some New Brighton homes that were raised, but they were significant to our history. This home, located on 3rd Avenue, belonged to George Kincaid, who was the son of Nellie Perry, Charles Perry's daughter. It was raised when the Golden Pond Senior Apartments were built. And located next to the Kincaid home, this home belonged to Ed and Hel Helen Shuda. It too was raised when the Golden Pond Senior Apartments were built. This home, located at 745 Fourth Avenue was the Barichka family home from 1945 when they purchased it until 1990 when it was sold. The home was built in 1925 and has been raised. A new home on the same location was occupied by a grandson of Julius and Rosina Barichka. The next home is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jack Bona and was located on Fourth Avenue in New Brighton. The home was taken for a new public center Safety Center in 2002. This photo shows the Hip family home, which was located in present day Long Lake Regional Park. Great grandfather Peter Hip began farming the land in the 1880s. His son Frank Hip and eventually his grandson Joe continued the farm. Joe Hip operated the Lakeside Berry Farm for many years, and four generations of Hip lived on the property. Now this home area is marked on the trails in Long Lake Park. So if you walk along the trails, you'll, you'll see the home, where the home site was. But the home burned several, many, many years ago as well. And um, the Hip family, or Joe Hip, sold that property to the city of New Brighton. And the story was that a million dollars worth of rhubarb and strawberry plants were moved to Elk River, which is the same rhubarb we get for the rhubarb fest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this home was later called the Orchard House as an apple orchard grew next door on Fifth, Fifth Avenue. In later years, it was owned by Otto Schmelzbauer. Other Owners included the Stenina family. 
People in the front are not identified. There. Please write on the back of your photos <laughs> because I have run into many issues of not knowing dates or people. Here's the family home of Jacob and Teresa Lear. The home was located on the north side of 10th Street near where the Long Lake Estates apartments are now located. It was torn down in 1987. And this is a photo of the rear of the Paul and Catherine Blansky home located at 669 6th Street. It was demolished in 1969. Standing in front is Francis Blansky Johnson. Shown here was the homestead of Felix and Mary Slatowski, who, cho who came to New Brighton in 1904 and homesteaded 40 acres along Long Lake Road near today's 14th Street. Mr. Slatowski acquired 60 additional acres in today's golf course area. The farm was chiefly a dairy operation. Now outside of New Brighton, all of these homes have been raised, but this was the homestead of David Lutz, located on County Road I and Long Lake Road. There was a family, David, Cecilia, Marion, Miles, and Gladys Lutz, and Mrs. Troseth. The home is longer, it, no longer there, but the original photo was loaned by Gladys Lutz Hagelin, daughter of David and Celia Lutz. Many of you probably remember the Hagelin family in New Brighton. Here's the Josephine and Paul Walduck homestead. I won't read everybody, it's on there, but the homestead was later sold to Otto Schmaltz Bar. It was located on Highway 8 in Mount Hue and was later taken for the arsenal construction. And next to it is a photo of the John and Clara Pletcher homestead in 1920. John became, began Pletcher's greenhouses on old Highway 8 in 1920. The home is no longer standing, but all of us have been to our beloved Pletcher's, haven't we? And we celebrated their 102nd anniversary last fall. Here's the homestead of Nicholas and Agnes Patel, the Indicowich located in Moundsview Township. Original home was situated on County Road I after having been moved from Arsenal Hill. And the Frank and Josephine Waldock home was located on Long Lake Road until just a few years ago when it was raised for new home construction. Here's the O'Connell home. It purchased 90 acres of land at Moundsview Township in 1902. Later, 60 more acres were added. It was located south of County Road H2 and east of Long Lake Road. It was built in 1908. John gradually sold parcels of the land for homes, including a large tract where Edgewood Middle School now stands, and had 25 acres left. The remaining 25 acres with the buildings were sold in 1972, and the buildings were demolished and new homes were built. This is the home of William and Anastasia Ryback on Old Highway 8 in Moundsview. The State Department bought the owners out in 1938 to improve the road for arsenal traffic. And this was the home of Frank and Stella Skiba in 1890. It was located across from the arsenal on Old Highway 8. Frank's parents, Joseph and Marianne Skiba, came to Minnesota from Canada in 1869 and brought property in Moundsview Township in 1870. Joseph and Marianne had 13 children, the oldest of whom was Frank, and the home no longer stands. Here is the homestead of Clement and Rose Blansky Skiba. The home was located in Moundsview Township and was condemned during World War II for a huge state highway project forced by heavy traffic in the Twin City Federal Arsenal Federal Defense Plant area. Pictured here is Gene Skiba, the son of Clement and Rose. Here's the homestead of the John Moga family. The family, the house was built in 1897, but the land was homesteaded in 1881. John's parents, Benedict and Victoria Moga's first home was only 12 by 16, not much of a shack, John Moga said. Its walls were packed with raked up leaves and hay as insulation against the severity of winter, and the home no longer stands which segues into our house, the New Brighton History Center. Bulwer Junction was built in 1887, and here's how it looked as it sat in its original site in South New Brighton. We have no date on this, but Wayne Searles just found this picture from family members. But that's how it looks now. 
but it did not look like that back early. Our house had living quarters for the station master's family, kitchen, living room, master, and children's bedroom. The Sioux line gave us the boat, the, the depot in 1982. Bob Proger of Proger House Movers moved the depot to city property and he remained there for, until 1990 while we fundraised to move and renovate the depot. We wrote a grant to celebrate Minnesota and were awarded $25,000 for renovating that depot, for that, the depot. Most of which went for moving it through the city of New Brighton, electric telephone lines, and putting a basement under it. But we had lots and lots of help with that. Whoop, the, there's how the depot looked at its original location on the south end of town. Then the big move through the city, then the depot sitting on city property, and then the depot would sit on these cribs before the basement was built. The basement was now completed. Then we completed, then we tackled the exterior. All exterior boards were removed and sanded off site to prevent lead paint seeping into the wetlands. Rick's roofing provided free labor to re-roof the depot. And I remember the day when the first day they got on, on the roof and their feet went right through the, the roof. So they had, we had to replace all the boards as well as the shingles and everything. Now to start on the interior, this is how it looked. Many of our senior members provided their help. Here's Louise Perrin, Louise Hip, and Gladys Walvon cleaning the filthy walls. Here's Dave Brewer. Gene Skiba and Lenny Klons, my late husband, cleaning the wooden walls and 13-foot high ceilings. Before painting, walls and ceilings had to be scrubbed with TSP, trisodium phosphate, and hot water. We so appreciated all of our volunteers who provided many hours of service. That's how it looked in the kitchen. The station master's family tried to make the depot more livable by wallpapering the walls and putting up ceiling tile. Unfortunately, wallpaper was tacked in place and then tiles nailed in place. We hand removed thousands of nail holes, holes throughout the living area before we could start on the interior renovation. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Nail holes patched on the children's bedroom walls. Note the unevenness of a construction. Railroads didn't spend a lot of money building their depots. But the maple flooring throughout was in fairly good condition. A few areas had flooring standing on edge from a leaky roof. After sanding, we wrote a grant to Velspar, which provided for gym finish for all the floors in the depot. We received several grants from Velspar Corporation through their picture and painted program, including exterior paint, interior paint, and gym varnish. Velspar provided remark invaluable guidance on the type and color of paint that they donated. The Society received two awards from Velspar for documentation on the exterior and interior renovation. We had to do that as part of the grant. All of the windows were broken when we received the depots. We had to reglaze new glass courtesy of By Swingers Hardware. The two chimneys were taken down before moving the depot as they were dangerous. My husband rebuilt both with fabric, and they now look original. In 1994, the Society was bequeathed the railroad collections of former Ramsey County Sheriff Kermit Hedman and his wife, Eileen Hedman, the second female village clerk of New Brighton. The Hedmans lived on Fifth Avenue, about where the New Brighton Public Safety Building is now. Here are some of the Hedman items on display. It was a wonderful collection. It took us forever to pick it all up, and, for, and we had to document every single piece we got in order to get it, uh, get it from them. The Hedman collection numbered over 3,000 items from which we were able to add interesting display areas to our museum. However, we have never forgotten that we are a museum for the entire New Brighton area, not just a railroad museum. I forgot to finish that sentence, but <laughs> finishing up the renovation. The city of New Brighton built our sidewalk and parking lot. As you can see, we needed help from many different groups. Sod was laid, trees were planted, and we were ready to open in 1995. Five long years of renovation completed. 
Shown below is Mayor Bob Benke with Senator Steve Novak and me at the depot dedication. In 1992, Valspar Corporation wrote to statewide cities wanting to donate their caboose, which was located near the Metrodome. It was used as a break room for their employees. The city of New Brighton encouraged us to apply for it, so I wrote another grant, and we soon found we were one of three finalists, one being the Mall of America. The final criteria was how are we going to get the caboose to our property. Valspar named it La Caboose and they stripped the interior, stripped it, and put paneling up. <laughs> Williams Pipeline volunteered to build the rail siding for us, and what a job that was, but they had the equipment. Armstrong Crane was moved the, the caboose from the main track to our siding. Armstrong prefer, per, per, performed the service gratis. I'll never forget that day because they came out and they had one large belt around the caboose and as as soon as they were ready to move it they decided nope they had to go back and put two large belts around it and then they swung it around and we all said it's that old adage measure twice cut once because it fit it fit on the track once the caboose was sighted on the siding it was time to repaint it so Valspar corporation provided the paint Great Northern provided the good decals for us, and Jerry and Dan Laumeyer did all the painting. However, after painting, we found that Great Northern gave us the wrong number. It should be X271, not X265. We'll correct it the next time we paint. Valspar had stripped the interior and applied wood paneling to the walls, and in the fall of 2014, the society began the renovation to return the caboose to its 19... 50s look. Paneling and wet insulation were removed. Interior steel walls were mitigated of mold. Car siding was installed on the walls and ceiling. New windows were built and constructed of bulletproof plexiglass donated by DeMar Signs. We forever were having kids throw rocks through the windows. And they have not since we have the plexiglass bulletproof. Flooring was repaired, sanded and varnished. Caboose, furnish, caboose furnishings were constructed. So here are some photos from before, during and after the renovation with completion in June 2016. Again, many contributed to the project. Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway Foundation, Great Northern Historical Society, New Brighton Lions, Rotary Sportsman's Club, as well as many individuals. We are not afraid to beg. <laughs> we consulted with the Lake Superior Railroad Museum in Duluth on appropriate paint colors and furnishings. And we must give credit where credit is due to Wayne Searles who did a lot of this project as well as Fred Behrens. And that's how it looked before we painted it. And then when we painted it, that was the color of cabooses at the time. Kind of a lime green and we looked at it they sent us a chip of it, we sent it to Valspar, and they said, this is it, but it looks very, very nice. You'll have to stop in and see it. So what else do we do? Well, for many years, we sponsored a rhubarb fest, and Fred talked about it, and we'll do it this year. This is, this, this is the crew that goes and picks rhubarb. We have some of those people here today. Raise your hand if you're a rhubarb picker, or the puller, which is the right word? Okay, you pull rhubarb, okay. And here's all the people that come. And we now have a full-time rhubarb jam maker here with Mary Berg, and she has some here to sell today. We sell cookbooks, we sell plants, we sell stocks. We serve, really, he said 200, but it really, he said 300, but it, I said 200, it is 300. And we have a stimulating annual meetings. Here's Dr. David Peterson at his presentation. I won't pronounce that word because I can't. <coughs> the Dakota people on Long Lake in 2022. At that same meeting, we presented the Shoreview Historical Society with this 1903 train board of Sioux Lines Depot 
Cardigan Junction, which was located in Shoreview but now raised. We always would hope that our Shoreview Historical Society was able to have that. So we have a representative here today. Thank you for coming. Andy Arista, during his program on historical reservation in 2020, showing one of the four wagon wheels he rebuilt for our baggage cart on our deck. He also restored our mail cart, both shown before renovation was done. Andy, raise your hand. <laughs> and we celebrated Civic Pride, a program produced by Wayne Searles in a few years ago. And who did we, the Rotary, the Lions, and the Sportsman's Club were all honored at that presentation. When Ice Castles came to Long Lake Park, the Society did a program called Ice Castles and Ice Harvesting on Long Lake. We featured photos and history of the St. Paul Winter Carnival Ice Castles, the Ice Castles in Long Lake Park in 2019, and how many local families earned their living cutting ice in Long Lake over the years. And we honored Pletcher's Greenhouses on their 102nd anniversary in October 2022. Top picture shows John and Glenn greeting each other at the program and it was so tender because they had not seen each other. They both were in different nursing homes at the time and that's the moment they greeted them. We had a cake for them and then grandson Brian showed a little bit of the history. One of the things we wanted to know was, how do you know when to plant what? And they knew, he knew. And we had over 30 Pletcher family members come to that event. Plank engraving. Shortly after our deck surrounding the depot was built, we started selling engraved plank things. We now have engraved 672 planks with names of our donors. The project is a major fundraiser for us and helps us to pay our utility bills, propane, insurance, and various other expenses. In the top, we see Jerry Bensing, and in the bottom, Ron Cota engraving planks. Raise your hand, Ron. A big, big job. Like Fred said, everybody on this board does something. We have no sitters. They're all doers. Photo collections. We have 5,000 photos from 191 donors, the majority of which have been scanned or copied. We maintain a Facebook page, New Brighton Area Historical Society, which shared approximately 1,000 photos, that's up to 2,000 now. We also share on neighborly New Brighton, and if you grew up in New Brighton, and occasionally I'll do, add something to the Shoreview area one and the Arden Hills one, especially if it has something to do with our area. We have walking tours. We place tour signage in Long Lake Park, marking the locations of the Lakeside Berry Farm, the stockyards, which were prominent in New Brighton in the 1890s, including the ice house locations, the railroad turntable, an engine house, the water tower, and the pump house. The walking tour starts on the west side of the beach, and here's the brochure that we hand out to our guests when they come. And we sell books. We have four books since 1980, three hardcover and one softcover. And you can buy those at By Swingers. They've been so loyal about letting us sell them there. Community Center, City Hall, at our History Center, and by mail. Stockyard Days. We've been active in Stockyard Days since its inception in 1981. In fact, the first two years, Stockyard Days was sponsored by us and the New Brighton JCs. The third year, Sock Air Days was incorporated to include all of the civic groups in New Brighton. Bylaws were adopted and 12 New Brighton organizations were given directorships. The Eagles, Eagles Auxil Auxiliary, Historical Society, Lions and Lioness, JCs and JC Women, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, the Sportsman's Club, the League of Women Voters, and the City. And as soon as they did, they did this, we, we at the Historical Society went, <laughs> <laughs> they now took it over. They've now completed 41 years as an event. In 2020, the Society honored its, honored its longtime volunteer, Lenny Klontz, my deceased husband, who spent hundreds of hours working on the depot, exterior, interior, and building the deck surrounding the depot. 
a park bench in his honor sits in front of the New Brighton History Center in Long Lake Park. And board members Wayne Searles and Ron Cota are shown installing the bench. Weddings. For some reason, our house is often the location for wedding photos, particularly on the caboose steps. Here's a few we've managed to capture. They just love it. And if we're there, uh, if they come on a weekend and we're open, I always run out and take a picture. When are we open? We're beginning the first Sunday in June through September 1st to 4, 1 to 4. We invite you to join us, but we also will do any off-hour tours as well. And that's our board, and they're all here tonight. See you all. So, we encourage membership in our group. Here's membership rates. I have some, some forms over on the table. If you are interested, we'd love to have you join us. And thanks for allowing us to share our story about historic homes and our home. Come and see us this summer. Oh, one other thing. We also have a virtual tour available on our website. So all you have to do, go to New Brighton History